so it's quarter after five in the morning because I decided why not wait until three in the morning uh, for Netflix to post mute since Paramount got all paranoid and decided to uh, bring their screen count down a little bit farther for a Annihilation so uh, it never came here and it's actually not even anywhere close to around here so uh, kind of I'm on the same page with all those people that were upset that it's not even in their country so <laughs> So there's that, um, but in the meantime, we still did end up getting a uh, sci-fi movie from an acclaimed rising sci-fi director. So, um, but did we get the same quality? It's kind of hard to say. But before I go into that, if you if you came here specifically for mute, uh, the time stamp will be down there. But for starters, I wanted to go in real quick to a movie that I thought I was going to have a lot more to say about which unfortunately I don't, um, and that is the new Nicolas Cage movie, Looking Glass, one of like four or five he's doing this year, and basically it was supposed to be this weird kind of thrill, you can kind of tell when you watch it, it's supposed to be like, they're kind of trying for like a Lynch type thing, trying being the key word, um, and what it basically ended up seeming to turn into was that it was the married couple is Cage and Robin Tony, and they take over this motel, basically, and it seems like it's going to be Vacancy, the Luke Wilson, Kate Beckinsale movie, um, with, with some twists and turns here and there, but that's not really the case. It's worth noting, I had to make sure, I had to go back and count um, as they were happening, and yeah, this movie has... 18, 18 executive producers, I don't know <laughs> what exactly that kind of signal that gives you, um, but yeah, and it's, it's, it could have very easily been a movie that was just so satisfyingly weird, especially with Cage being the star of it, um, but it is just another one of those movies where if you're like me and you just want to see every single thing that Cage does. That's pretty much the only reason you would ever have to seek this out. Um, it's... It, it, there's... What they really could... It could have been intriguingly weird. But instead, it's it's just way too amateur-like to come off of that. And the... Come off as that. Which is weird because the director actually has plenty of credits to his name. Going back at least to uh, Tex with Matt Dillon... Which I think was what the 80s. I know that's given the type of movie this is. It's a weird comparison anyway, but still. Um, and but aside from some surprisingly decent stuff that Cage actually gets to do within this, uh, the performances really aren't that great. You can see where it's going from a mile of the, the second one particular character is introduced. You know exactly what the rest of the movie is. It's one of those. Um, it's for some reason staying at this hotel turns people into sex addicts. They don't really say that outright, but that just kind of seems to, to be the case here, where it tries to turn into like this kinky erotic thing or whatever. Um, but it's it's quite embarrassing actually. You can tell where there's moments where it should be really suspenseful, uh, but it's just too fucking dumb to get there, and you don't feel that at all. Um, and they try to do, like, a voyeuristic thing, but like I was just talking about with the ritual last week, it's like, they want to do the voyeur thing, yet they get so right up close and personal to it. Um, and it's like, if you had shot this from a distance, and it's got and it's accompanied with this really ridiculous, idiotic music that, like, really tries to rev it up or something, when material like this should really be kind of played as far away as possible, because that's the whole fucking point. But, um... Yes, and so I was hoping to at least take away something to where it's like, like if I were to explain some of the things that happen in this, you would be saying like, oh my god, that sounds so crazy, especially if it stars Cage, I should seek this out. Um, but no, that's just going to lead to disappointment. It's not that kind of weird. It's It strives to be that kind of weird and just falls short every time because of just complete and total stupidity. Not worthwhile whatsoever. So with that out of the way now, um, sadly, uh, I would now like to go into Mute, which, 
is Duncan Jones. After, obviously, he made Moon to start with, and I believe most of us fell in love with Moon. And then he followed that up with Source Code, which I think most people like pretty well. I, I like it pretty well. Not as much as I did when it first came out, because the novelty has long since passed. Um, but yeah, it's totally fine. And then there was Warcraft, and we know how that went. So hopefully this was him kind of coming back to that moon territory, and he even came out and said a long time ago, I remember, that this was like a spiritual sequel to Moon, or at least in the same universe, um, which I don't think it's real spoiler to say, as I'm sure it's going to get out there very quickly. Um, yes, there is one very tiny scene that lets us know that this is in Moon's universe, and it's basically a joke. It's, it's it's a somewhat comedic scene, and then that's it. Um, and you would think with all the directions that Moon went, and everything that it raised with its... I mean, you would think it would be a bit more profound, but no, it's just like kind of a throwaway joke. Uh, that this is in the same universe, and then that's gone. Never to be heard from again. So, and you would never really... You would never really get that vibe if that scene wasn't there, because... Yes, um, as if we don't have enough of these, this is yet another movie, another sci-fi movie that's basically set in the Blade Runner world. Um, that exact, the whole neon lights, the buildings, the, the, the smoke, um, the every damn thing that's in Blade Runner. Um, only it's like, I, it kind of felt like he was trying to do the Blade Runner world through the eyes of like Wong Kar Wai or something, which... Um, sounds much more appealing than it turns out. Like I said, you can, if you get it, you can kind of get that might have been the vibe he was going for, but that's as good as you're going to get <laughs> in regards to that. Um, and the plot is supposed to be this shock surprise. I think they're trying for a noir thing again. Um, and so, <laughs> because that's, I guess, people think that in this futuristic neon world goes with that. So, this whole disappearance thing, where Alexander Skarsgård is obviously a mute character because he got his throat cut by the propeller of a boat when he was a child, somehow survived, but can not can no longer speak, of course. Um, and this becomes quite a hindrance, more so than it already is, when he has to go on this one-person hunt um, for his girlfriend that has gone missing in the middle of the night. Apparently. The first problem right off with this is that there's not really... I don't... Maybe I just wasn't quite into it at this point, even though it's so early, but it's like... There's hardly an indication that this is a disappearance. Like, you only know it's a disappear. Like, okay, here's the thing is, you know it's a disappearance because when you bring it up on Netflix, the first thing you see is that little description. So it was like, uh, I didn't know the story even going in. I knew nothing about it except that um, Paul Rudd was in it and the whole moon connection. I didn't even know Skarsgård was the main star. So, <laughs> and the thing here is that, so that told me, yes, his girlfriend disappears and he has to hunt for her and all that. But even knowing that, immediately when I hit play, knowing that, um, when she disappears in the movie... They're so nonchalant about it that's never really... The fact that the the way it flows into the scene when he wakes up in bed alone, I just assumed that she just wasn't there. I didn't realize, oh, that's the disappearance. And the movie's not in that big of a damn hurry to, sh to get us to realize, hey, this is what set the plot off. This little dissolve. This <laughs> whatever. Um... So, yeah, it probably took, I don't know, maybe you can put this on me if you want to, but I guess it was about maybe half an hour or 40 minutes in before I was like, oh, I guess the plot is kicked in. I couldn't really tell. <laughs> um, and another way that I found this really confusing was that this movie, this movie's basically two movies. I mean, they do connect in a way that, to be fair, ultimately makes sense for the most part. Is, is, it makes sense just enough to get by without it completely falling apart trying to put together its pieces. But <laughs> there's still... I still feel like there's some things that need a little more elaboration here. But, um... Yeah, apart from the fact that they obviously will eventually connect. We know this. Um, it does feel like two different movies for a long, long time. 
We've got the Skarsgård plot where he's on this very mundane mystery, just going from place to place, just pointing at pictures and writing shit down, and like, do you know this? And then just nothing particularly engaging. Uh, that's all he can do. It's like, you see, you hear Skarsgård's got this role, and it's like, oh, he's not going to be able to speak, but he has to find, he has to go through the whole mystery thing. And then it's like, how's he going to handle this? Like, how expressive is he going to be? And like, how are they going to work with this whole setup? Uh, and it's so intriguing, but it's like, and you saw, you know, and I, obviously this is like working with minimalism when you look at it this way, where it's, an actor has to do this without using his voice. You think, well, this director's the dude that made a whole movie just with Sam Rockwell. <laughs> just with Sam Rockwell on the moon, and we saw all the different things he was able to do with that. Um, and we don't get any of that. He just does his thing, just kind of totally straight-faced, kind of emotionless. Towards the end, they kind of hint, maybe that's the point, that he's not very emotive, that he's expressionless, doesn't seem to have a much of a soul here, but it's... No, well, there's so many things that contradict that anyway, but <laughs> there's... I, and, like, the whole plot, the fact that he's driven enough to go on this whole odyssey to find her, even though it honestly feels like an afterthought every time we cut back to it, because, like I was saying with the two different movies thing, so much time is devoted to these two surgeons who are Paul Rudd and Justin Thoreau. Um, and it's one of those cases where, this is one of those movies where you're constantly asking yourself, like, so is this going to eventually get to this, and is this going to be the, what is this, where are these two things going, and why does it seem like they're in such opposite directions? But you probably asked yourself that plenty of times during other movies, but the reason you were asking is because you wanted to know. I don't... This... <laughs> I don't, there's... I don't even... Because you would think there would at least be enough focus on one to at least make you feel that way about one of the stories, if not both. But it just gets you so kind of lost and confused, I'm assuming unintentionally. Um, you're, I mean, obviously, the, what, there's an intention to have a little mystery to it, but I mean, there's <laughs> there's no indication these two things are going to collide anytime soon. And that's only going to hold your interest for so long. And this movie really falls victim to that. So... And I guess, I guess the intention, maybe, was to have a bit of a balance, because the Skarsgård story is, like, practically humorless. It's just very straightforward, him just, like I say, constantly stone-faced, just pointing at shit, trying to find where she is. Um, I mean, there is the whole fucking robot scene. You want to consider that humor, I guess. And yes, that is Dominic Monaghan. I had to wait for the credits to make sure. <laughs> um... But, yeah, for the most part, those scenes are serious, so then when we get the Paul Rudd, Justin Thoreau scenes, those are kind of supposed to be, like, comedic scenes, and it's like, okay, so we're doing a drama-comedy balance, that's why we're getting so much of both of them, and not just one seems like a small side plot that's eventually going to come into this. Um, but the thing is, is that this movie has no tone. It has no, It does not seem to have any particular emotional direction. Um... At least for, like, what this movie turns into in the last half hour or so just seems so incredibly distant from what we've seen before it. And not in the way to where it's like, you're, uh, it's reached the point to where the movie has to have a catharsis or something, or has to have a particular meaning or whatever. It just feels like it went in a totally <laughs> different direction um, than what we were previously setting up here. It doesn't even feel in the same universe, really. So, I don't know. But, um, and then, on top of that, we have things that, obviously, it feels like, at the start, it feels like that Rudd and Thoreau are a branch off of the Skarsgård story. But then we've got stuff branching off the Rudd-Thoreau story. We don't get that in the Skarsgård story, at least that I really remember. Is that bad that I'm sitting here saying, if I remember when I finished watching this movie fucking ten minutes ago? Um, but yeah, so there's this whole thing with um, Justin Thoreau being a pedophile. Like this kind of hippie sort of... 
Not that those things are connected, but yeah, this is just how confusing it all is. How kind of jumbled it all is. Um, and I'm not really completely sure what the purpose of a lot of this is. Um, and this is one of those things where they just kind of... It's obviously there the whole time, just the way Thoreau's character acts and what he does and what he says. It's really weird and gross and uncomfortable, but then there's a point in the movie where they, long after this is established, they treat it like it's this some kind of revelation about the character. I don't know. And then they basically just dismiss the whole thing with him getting a firm talking to. Um, I don't... I don't know what this is doing in here. <laughs> it's like, I, I don't know, but, um, and he's, and, and it will probably get annoying very fast that, um, Justin Thoreau in this movie calls people babe probably twice as many times as DiCaprio says old sport in The Great Gatsby. So, I don't even think that's an exaggeration. So, <laughs> if that's the kind of thing that just kind of irks you a little bit, uh, I'm sorry. Um, now, it's not to say it's not, there aren't, you know, decent things in here, or things that you can definitely tell felt like setups as something much better. Like, some of the scenery, um, is really well put together. I really like the, um, the bowling alley set. Like, it's three, a three-story bowling alley, like, at least, and the way they kind of have one fluid shot that shows that is really cool. Not that this bowling alley scene has a particular purpose in the long run, but, <laughs> but it's here. And it looks nice, I suppose. Um, and then we have stuff like, um, there's this, like that, that the opening. I mean, there's this whole setup from the get-go about um, Scarzo's character being from an Amish community that ultimately ends up uh, in this futuristic world. They don't really go into that much. And it's, I guess, not very important anyway. But the thing that I found interesting about it, which is pretty much the only thing it's worth, is um, that when we open there, we see this girl, and she's in the Amish getup, I guess, um, to where it looks like this could be a scene from, like, the 1800s or something. But because we don't really know anything going in if you didn't read it, if you read into it as little as I did, um... You just kind of buy, oh, this must be... I mean, I guess the boat would contradict this itself, but um, there's... It had this very old-looking quality to it, like it was a set from The Witch or something. And then just a mere few decades later, um, the Blade Runner world. Uh, that can be effectively jarring to jo go from this place and think you're in one place and then end up in this one. Uh, with just one small time jump. Small in the whole grand scheme of things, of course. Um, but, yeah, like I said, it just still has a whole bunch of stuff that we maybe could have gone more into, but then again, it's like, is it really worth it? Like, is, is, the, is the setup even make you even remotely curious to go into that anymore? Maybe if we had gotten a little more on it um, to kind of give us a taste of this is the direction this could be or what could hint at or whatever, but just not really anything of that that I caught anyway. So there's that. Um, and yeah, I'd say the high point, and it's not so much his performance itself. Like, it's not Paul Rudd is so good in this, you have to check it out. I'd say the main reason to check it out is to just see Paul Rudd play this kind of character. Which, obviously, there are some Paul Rudd-isms in there, or whatever you want to call them. Uh, a couple of moments where Paul Rudd himself kind of came out and made me laugh when I'm not sure he was supposed to or not. So, uh, <laughs> but, um, yeah. And that's, that's pretty much the extent of it uh, for me. But there is... That does take us in some interesting directions, regardless, that I obviously can't go too much into. But I will say, speaking of him, um, it's also just kind of... Like, the way it's put together also kind of feels very... Not particularly polished in post-production, if you will. Like, um, the first time we see Paul Rudd. Um, his intro feels incredibly misplaced when we see him at the club. 
because there is nothing we get from this intro that could not be fixed by simply cutting it out and having his intro be when we see him operating for the first time, when we also meet Justin Theroux's character. I can't think of a single reason that is the scene that introduced us to this character because it did nothing for him and it's like right in the middle of when we're getting Skarsgård's whole layout um so it's and it's and it's very brief so that in itself just kind of was this, this very kind of offset thing and that's also why it's even more confusing that they feel like two parallel stories instead of one being much more prominent than the other because that in itself makes it seem like Oh, Paul Rudd's just a minor character in Skarsgård's life, and that's going to be where we go. Um, but no. So there's that. And then just, like I said, little things like that can make that much of a difference, even if they don't seem uh, that particularly crucial. And then there's um, just just the usual, you know, gripes or whatever about stuff like this, like the use of exposition. Like, there's one particular moment towards the beginning when we've got um, the girlfriend's flamboyant best friend, or whoever he is, because of course. Um, and it's like, you get the vibe that these people have worked together for a long time, they've known each other for a long time, they are very... Obviously, he and this girl seem awfully close, and this is her boyfriend and all that. But then, because it's the beginning of the movie, this guy, who I imagine has known Skarsgård for at least a little while now, decides to say, So why can't he talk anyway? It's like, I don't, I, don't know, I don't know exactly how long these people have known each other, but I'm pretty sure I got the vibe that he's known him long enough that he doesn't need to still be asking that question. And we as the audience know, because we saw it in the opening scene. So what good does this do? It gets the movie to two hours and six minutes, I guess. Um, and there's nothing particularly... Here's the problem, too, is with the way a mystery works, just by definition, really is you go one gradual step at a time and you slowly put pieces of the puzzle together and then that puzzle finally gets like one more piece that brings it into play and then you get the whole thing and it's the big reveal and then you get to rethink everything you just saw as it all adds up well this movie's not interested in doing that either um, this movie is interested in Skarsgård going from one mundane lead to one mundane place after the other with no real particular connection until finally just they just drop the bomb they just they just drop it they just give it all to us like all at once with no real build up at all <laughs> um and then it's treated as this big reveal pretty much uh and that's it's, there's just i and that's what sucks what sucks, really, is that it's, the thing that makes it worse is the fact that you would think it would get worse as it goes on because of this, but it's like the more it went on, the more I could see, oh, you might have greatness here if you just had the right build-up to it, but you had just had this thing all over the fucking place when you got to these points. And it's like, and it's not like these scenes are particularly good and they, like, elevate the movie, but they made me realize... I guess why one would do in the writing process or the editing process or whatever why one would make the movie like this when it seemed so why the fuck would you do that at the start um, but it's once again it doesn't come together enough to make it be like oh well the whole movie makes sense now uh, like I said there is a fraction of that here but all it really does is make you s say Oh, I I finally realized where this movie could have been great because honestly I wasn't I wasn't really there uh, I could not take my mind there but I see where it could have been great now because of where we end up but the damage has already been done and the reveal doesn't fix what's already broken behind it uh, so which usually like I said these stories are kind of tailor made to pull something like that off. And this is pretty far away from that. Um, and it's also one of those cases where, when I say a fraction, a part of the problem is when you kind of look at it and you think, okay, how were there no clues to this at all? We've spent so much time with these characters. How was there, like, not one clue to this? This specific thing. This very, very crucial specific thing. 
And I don't mean that in the way of they were cleverly maneuvering around it to keep things from us. Um, no, it's just like they kept anything remotely related to this just absent entirely. Just so we could have the big reveal without giving us even the slightest clue that this would be what it was. Um, it was just, I guess it was, the main priority was the element of surprise. Which, uh, once again, for a mystery is not the way to go. You want to be a lot more clever than that uh, when you're creating this puzzle. Uh, you want to you wanna know that there's an entire hole here before you split it up into the puzzle pieces, but these, yeah, this <laughs> doesn't really work that way. Um, and, you know, and like I was saying at the start, it's like, I mean, if you've seen it now and you're watching this, it's like, for me to say right now, the movie's got tonal issues would be about would be me pointing out the blatantly obvious as much as saying this movie is called mute and it's it, yeah yes it's <laughs> i i don't i yeah but i i already went into that um and like i was saying it's really one of those cases where i never really despite everything that's going on and all the confusion and all the but how does this come to this i never really once found myself asking i how does it end like, I wonder how it ends. Where do we get from... I was so concerned with all the other shit trying to think of how this could possibly tie together um, that I was never going that far. And once again, that might sound like a positive, but it's really not in the way that it should be was where my mind was processing, oh, how do these fit together? So, but I think you've got that by this point. Um, and, and another huge problem... Even though, like I said, I could under I started to understand where they were coming from from a story perspective when it all started to come together. But once it all starts to come together, and because the Netflix time is like right there with just the slightest move of a mouse, once it got to a certain point, I constantly was asking myself, how is there this much time left? Like, where else can this possibly go at this point? This is clearly a climax. Um, but yeah, it does find its way. And when I say this, it was like 30 minutes, 30 or 35 minutes left. When I'm asking, how can you have, how can you possibly have that much time left? Um, so, uh, yeah. Um, but, I mean, you know, it's... I mean, not not that this, you know, excuses the quality of the movie itself, but it is obviously nice that we got the little Bowie tribute. Um, but, yeah, so, and I get, and with the little message he put on there, you kind of get where he wanted to put the heart of the movie. Whether it actually came off like that's where it was is a whole other thing. Um... I, I'm really not sure how people are going to take to this. I can't imagine it's going to be particularly well-liked. Certainly not uh, to the degree that some of his other movies have been. Um, that's I guess that even includes Warcraft, because there are some people out there that are passionate about Warcraft, of course. So, yeah, that's, that's a disappointment, because I was actually really starting to get hyped for this. Um, I mean, I, I was when it was, like, first announced, because I really loved Moon so much, but, uh, yeah, it's, that's, that's what it is. I'm sure you'll, I'm sure many people who aren't up at 10 till 6 in the morning have a lot more to say, more in depth, probably more coherently, but, uh, yeah, just right after watching it, that's what's going on in my head with it right now, so... Yes, and we still got three more movies to talk about. Uh, let's talk about Winchester, a movie I was really late on, but once again, I didn't have Annihilation to see, so why not? Um, this is obviously another one of those horror movies that's inspired by actual events. I, I totally believe you, by the way. I believe you every time. <laughs> so, um, what this one is, this was the movie that had everyone begging the question, what the hell is Helen Mirren doing now? Fate of the Furious, and now this. I believe I saw one critic say the words, um, the exact words. She's in the 
Al Pacino, I don't give a fuck territory right now. Uh, I, I guess. So, um, I suppose I can kind of see where she might take interest in a part like this. Maybe not necessarily the movie as a whole, but maybe a part like this would appeal to her, I suppose. Um, where we're dealing with, it's, it's another haunted house movie. That's really all we need to know plot-wise. But, um, there is a psychologist played by Jason Clark who is supposed to come in and I guess she wants to be evaluated by him to make sure she's not going totally insane with all the potential ghosts and shit. I don't know, it's a little vague. <laughs> at least. But he's been hired there for a very large sum of money. Uh, and we find him all drugged out with prostitutes. It's like, um, when it, it's like in From Hell, when they had to go track down Depp in the opium dens. I don't know if that's the vibe they were going for or not, but, uh, yes. So, um, and, uh, of course, it does, it is kind of an interesting addition to make him a drug addict, because that's what makes him, obviously you're gonna have to have your characters that dis they don't just say, oh, shit, yep, ghosts do exist, the movie's over now. Um, no, he's able to quickly dismiss seeing ghosts as, oh, shit, the drugs haven't worn off yet. So, you know, that's... Okay, I'll take that. Sure. Uh, <laughs> and then we also have, um... We also have Sarah Snook in the cast, doing her best Jodie Foster impression. Um, who was so great in Predestination, which, uh, these are the same directors they did, like... They just most recently did Jigsaw, they also did Daybreakers, they did that... I talked about this when we talked about Jigsaw, they did that crazy undead movie. Um, and, yeah, they do bring, obviously, a little something to this. Um, a little bit more than you would probably expect from your typical PD-13 Haunted House movie. Um, not just the fact that it stars Ellen Mirren, <laughs> there's actually a little more. Um, it's... I noticed immediately like, right off, and I'm really surprised they stuck with it. Like, I thought this was just going to be, uh, oh, they got one thing right for a second, I suppose. But no, um, the whole movie is really well shot. Like, it, it's really appealing to look at, this movie, which kind of blew my mind. Um, and honestly does make a huge difference throughout the movie. Like, I found my patience with this movie being a lot more, um, kind of steady, because at least had that really good element going consistently. Um, so that was definitely a huge aspect. It felt very much like um, like the Hammer movies. It felt very much like that. So that's a good place to be. Not to say it doesn't still have some stupid horror shit in it. Especially at the, at the very beginning. Like, I was already won over by how good it looked. But that's not to say that the beginning isn't still really stupid. Um... Well, the first big scare in the movie is we gotta be afraid of a child with a bag on his head walking around the hallways. And, <laughs> and oh, that's not it, though. Uh, also, his eyes change to white, uh, and he does the whole, um, he's coming for us, and he points to the attic. And it's like, he his voice sounds like a, a, a brother, like an eight-year-old brother trying to scare his four-year-old sister by putting on a voice. That's what it came off as. Not particularly threatening or frightening or anything like that. It's kind of like in uh, Halloween when Tommy's trying to scare Lindsay. It came off like that. <laughs> Only it's supposed to be like, he's warning of a legitimate threat, I suppose. So, um, as it goes on, one of the things I actually noticed that was putting me off a little bit, not too much, but I kind of kept forgetting that time period this was set in, despite the fact that it so clearly has a period piece look to it, and I think, for whatever reason, Jason Clark was giving me that vibe. I don't know if it's, like, some of the ways he reacted to things, or if it's just his appearance in general, or what it is, but, um, he didn't really feel like he was of that era, and it kind of, I suppose it kind of helps a little bit, because he's kind of like the outsider coming in, so there's just kind of a different vibe about him altogether, um, but yeah, just for some reason, I kind of kept forgetting that this took place in like 1906, or whatever it was, um, <laughs> so that, but that's, wasn't really doing too much harm, because most of the movie, 
In fact, I'm thinking about it now, revisiting it in my head, like 98% of this movie is inside the house, I think. A, a lot of the movie is just inside the house, so that's really all we need. That's the only place we really need to be. Um, but it does still have those moments. Obviously, you're wondering, well, okay, if it has, if it seems like it has a particular elegance to it, if it has a really nice aesthetic to it. Like I said, you got to bring some class because Helen Mirren's in this movie. Um, are we still going to do the whole jump out and scare you thing? Obviously. Uh, this is this movie loves uh, making the small act of doors opening um, as a giant uh, jump out and scare the shit out of you thing. Or at least they're attempting to scare the shit out of you with it. Um, and, and like I said, every time you know the eyes would change, it's like, it's it's almost laugh inducing, unfortunately. So this is you'll see the problem very quickly, is that this is a horror movie, where the horror scenes are easily by far its weakest aspect. <laughs> so and you would think that means oh well then the whole thing must be terrible because the whole you know house of cards must collapse if it's if the scare scenes don't work and it's a horror movie. Um, but no, the rest of the stuff is well done enough to where it doesn't completely collapse on itself. Um, but there are, like, there are some scares where it's like, that could have worked. It could have worked. Like, um, the mirror. Um, I feel like it could have worked if it weren't for the fact that they milked the shit out of that. <laughs> they really, really milked that mirror, uh, for all it was worth. And by the time the actual big scare happens, I mean, it's like... It's, we've already, you know, seen the blueprint. We know the whole thing by the time it finally gets to that point. So that kind of watered it down with what could have been a legitimately effective scare. Um, and, but what, what I think does help is the fact that um, their attempts at scares are not constant, which are usually the problems with these. So it does take its time to, like, Oh, this is the way this character... This is the reason this character acts this way, and this is the reason that character acts that way, and all that shit. We have some backstories here and there. Not that any of that stuff is particularly interesting, but the fact that they have the presence of mind to take those breaks and give it a go, and not just try to do the constant scary shit, or the ghost shit, or whatever, um, shows that there is an effort here. Um, and once, though, we get in... I mean, talking about the effort, sure. Um, and I'm not quite sure what all is the real story and what isn't, but, I mean, in regards to this movie by itself, whether the, whether the shit is based on the way she actually handles the house and all that, or handled the house and all that, but uh, this whole thing about why the ghosts are here and how they kind of correlate with the house and what exactly is going on, it's... I can imagine that seeming like a good idea on paper. And it's like, well, this is because of this, and that's because of that. But the thing is, is it starts to get so absurdly elaborate um, to where it's kind of like, okay, it's... We're going from, okay, this is an interesting idea, but then actually seeing it play out and hearing it all in one, like, exposition dump is like, okay, this is a little ridiculous, and it's like, just how long does this go on, and it's like, we start here, and it's like, well, because of this, and you're like, oh, that makes sense, but then they're also doing this, and then we do this whole thing, and it's like, this is ridiculous. <laughs> um, but you had a nice start, and I do under I do get how this could work within this horror setup. Um, but like I said, it gets it gets pretty absurd pretty fast. Um, and then once that's established, um, it does kind of start to become a bit of a bore, because once we get that whole thing laid out, um, the movie doesn't seem to feel like it needs to move forward anytime soon, now that we've got all that information out there. Um, and once that's established, and then it becomes very quickly all about the loud noises and the scary faces and all that. Um, so, in obviously we get the old, um, 
I mean, what's what's a horror or haunted house movie without the the old cliche of, oh, this is the person you've been talking to the past couple of days? Well, that person's been dead for years. We get that old thing, and it actually becomes like a whole major. Like we pretty much stay in that direction, and then the movie really starts to fall apart. It has. I mean, it's this. I'm sh this is better than I'm sure the reviews told you honestly, but, um, it really, once we get to the ending, it really starts to half-ass it, like, a lot. Like, this is such a, this is such a half-assed conclusion, <laughs> um, that it's, obviously, you can tell, looking back, it's actually quite hysterical how half-assed this conclusion is, but, I mean, really, I was really surprised how much there actually is to like in it, but, you know, when you look at the scale, it's, yeah, because the stupid is really, really stupid, and the played-out horror cliches are really, really played-out and tired. So, yes, but I was actually surprised that there were a few things in this movie that aren't that bad and were surprisingly consistent most of the time. Um, but nevertheless, I mean, at the end of the day, it's still another one of its kind, um, it just, there's a couple of things that make it better than the worst of the bunch, so, yeah, <laughs> if that's a compliment, I guess. Alright, our third movie is going to be Peter Rabbit. Um, I didn't really know what to make of this. I had seen, I remember leafing through the books when I was... I don't even know that I could fucking read at that point in time. Uh, but the illustrations are very familiar to me and bring back some kind of memory I can't quite pinpoint. So, looking at this, we have um, Sony, I believe. And what seems to have happened here is that we had the Smurfs movies, the first two Smurfs movies. And we're like, um, why don't you just fucking make it all animated because this is ridiculous. You've got live action, you got Neil Patrick Harris, and you got the Smurfs, and it's, it just, it's just bad. And so they're like, okay, fine, we'll make a third Smurfs movie, and we'll make it all animated. And then we saw how that turned out, and they were like, you know what, why don't we just go back to what we were doing? <laughs> we can't be any worse off, I guess. We've already done, both don't work, so let's just continue to not work in the way we were not working the first time. So, let's do the animation and the live action. Um, though, uh, despite the Smurfs comparisons, given the company, among other th reasons, um, it felt very much, and I don't know if this is just the British tone or what it is, but and the fact that we just had this movie, but it's like, it does also feel like it's pretty much trying to capture that same magic of Paddington um, and the... Uh, Gleason Sr. won out on this one, to be sure. So, <laughs> um, and I wasn't even, like I said, I wasn't even sure what the story was. I didn't really know anything except I'm sure that these animated rabbits were going to be fucking around, wreaking havoc, whatever. Maybe like a dumbed-down Sean the Sheep or something. Uh, that's kind of the thought I had in my head. Um, and... It's, well, actually, it feels like it could have gone in a couple of different directions. I suppose that was the fun of not knowing what it was, was there was, like, three times in this movie where I was like, oh, are we going in this direction? Okay, I guess not. Um, conveniently enough, conveniently timed enough, it, honestly, this movie could have been, like, a feature-length version of the Garden Party anime short that's one of the ones that's nominated for the Oscar right now. Um, if you saw that Garden Party short, you know the darker direction that it went in. Um, Peter Rabbit could have been that at feature length. It really could have. <laughs> but, um, no, it had a couple more directions it wanted to go in. Um, and, and they try to win us over early. Because they give us a little backstory. And I made it like the old illustrations. Um, but then we put that to rest very quickly, and we come back out into this world or whatever, where they live on this, in this garden area, wherever it is they live in, where apparently Rose Byrne lives by herself with the wild animals, because someone who looks like Rose Byrne would do that. 
Uh, and we have, you know, stuffy businessman up his own ass, Donald Gleason, who seems to hate everything, um, is basically given this place in an inheritance and comes out here to do his... I don't know. It's all vague to me. It was like a week ago I saw this. <laughs> um, but obviously, he's going to come out here. He's going to change his ways once he meets the animals. After he hates them for about an hour and a half. And falls in love with Roseburn. End of story. Falls in love with Roseburn very, very abruptly. Because the plot must go on. Um, and so, worth noting, at the very start, we probably should, even though we're long past the very start. The Peter Rabbit is voiced by James Corden. And what James Corden seems to be showing off is that he's basically, like, the go-to guy for stuff that's probably a bad idea. Particularly with voice work. Because it's like, hey, you need a high-five emoji for the emoji movie? Get James Corden. Hey, we're gonna do a live-action slash animated Peter Rabbit thing that's basically just another not very inspired and not very creative kids movie. Let's get James Corden again because his voice his voice sounds like he's constantly having fun whether we are or not. He sounds like he is. But I say that even though when it starts off and he's like running through and he's like greeting everybody because he's like hey this is the start of the movie this is where I run through and introduce all the characters one by one as I run by them and say something funny or do some slapstick bullshit or something but it's like sometimes he seems like he really wants to do this but other times like this introduction scene which you would think would be the opening when we introduce the character that he'd be his most energetic um, doesn't really seem like that like, he's just walking by, and he's, like, saying lines. He's not particularly jovial. He's not particularly hyper. He's hard, He's not... Doesn't seem very much like the, uh... Rambunctious hero we're supposed to be getting to know that's gonna take us through this. No, he just kind of says his lines. Like, it's James Gordon reading the script. Just straight into the microphone for the first time. Like, never having laid eyes on it. Um, and so that's our intro to him. And we also, obviously, we're going to see other familiar voices in here, like Margot Robbie and Daisy Ridley. But it's like, you can tell, um, their characters are so not crucial, and that it's like, okay, so you wanted Margot Robbie and Daisy Ridley's names on the poster, I get it. Once again, the end. Um, weirdly enough, the most unrecognizable person in the movie is on fucking screen, in person. Uh, it's, I, I mean, I kind of, as soon as I saw him, I was like, it's that Sam Neill, but it took me a few looks to actually say, yes, that is Sam Neill to myself, um, which obviously they, they go out of their way to waste a perfectly good Sam Neill, once again, because we have to set the plot off, um, and so, yeah, had it been the animals versus him, this would be a totally different movie, and I think would be something worthwhile, and would feel something, like, kind of a bit classical in the way of the story. Um, but, but, but no, we gotta do the young love thing. Uh, we gotta do the... <laughs> um, there's, I mean, okay, before we even go into that, as far as the humor goes, um, there is, a, a lot of it is just kind of, like, it, it feels like these jokes kind of go way back in a bad way. Like, for instance, the deer that always stands in front of cars and says, oh, headlights, and he just repeats headlights, because, you know, deer and headlights, it's like they're attracted to them, that's how I all end up getting hit and all that. But it's like, yeah, I'm sure people came to the conclusion that uh, it's almost like deer actually do that, like, 50 years ago or something. So, uh, in this movie, in 2018, it doesn't feel like it's all that fresh in the humor department. Um, see also when he says, um, tomato, tomato, that's like potato, potato. You don't hear anybody say potato. Have you ever thought about that? It's like, yeah, Peter Rabbit, I think we've all at least thought that once or twice because we've been hearing the fucking tomato thing since fucking forever. So, 
no, that's not particularly fresh either. So this is, and this is what a lot of the lines are. This is basically what's passing as the humor, I guess, um, when they're not running around and knocking shit over. That's what we do. There's the moment when he's trying to straighten the picture of his parents out. He's like, do it a little this way, and then do it a little that way, and it's like the joke. The joke is that they're it's taking him forever. Put that fucking picture up. That's it. This goes on for a fucking eternity. Or at least it feels like it. Uh, <laughs> and that's, once again, we're just, we're just milking shit. Um, and that's what this does. There's also the, um, the joke when they're walking slowly. You know, the one that was in Horrible Bosses 2. And I'm sure it was done somewhere before that, too. Um, the stuff that's even, I, I guess, that's supposed to be funny, when Rose Burns watching Donald Gleason from a distance, and he's being, he's doing something weird, and she's like, oh, well, that's not normal. Oh, well, that's kind of normal, but no, that's definitely not normal. And it's like, this is just, this is what it does. This is the, <laughs> this is the humor. Um, once again, it's not just crashing into shit. So, and I know, I know, this is another one of those movies that can be defended to the death by just saying... It's a kid's movie, what do you expect? Um, but that's the problem, is we live in a post-Paddington world. The bar has been set, and if you go lower than that bar, or at least you can't look like you're trying to somewhat reach that bar, or getting a little close, you're embarrassing yourself. You look pathetic. <laughs> because Paddington, among others, but Paddington seems to be kind of the gold standard currently, once again, especially since we just had the second one, um, where you can totally make a kid's movie that's smart and sweet and hilarious kind of all at once. Uh, has ideas, does its own thing, has its own style. Um, and but th then you get, it just really highlights how lazy movies like this feel. How it feels like there's no effort whatsoever. Like I said, when you get stuff like, um, like when Paddington has, like, real cast members in it. Hugh Grant with that BAFTA nomination, for instance. And this movie says, Margot Robbie and Daisy Ridley will do Voices of the Rabbits so we can put their names on the poster. You see a clear, di a clear difference here. And I see, yeah, you can get a quality actor like Donald Gleeson, for instance. But, I mean, this character is so... Over, we know every single turn that this character's gonna make because we've seen movies that are ancient. <laughs> this is the same old character of oh, he's mean and he's nasty, but eventually he'll have a heart of gold once he falls in love and realizes he likes cute animals and doesn't want to kill them. What does this have to offer? And I probably seem a bit more irritable than I feel about the movie itself. I mean, you can't... I mean, it's difficult to... I, yes, I do say, even in a post paddington world, movies like this should not be accepted, or at least rarely accepted. Um, but, I mean, still, it's not a movie that's insulting enough to say, you know this is bad for your children or something. It's not to that extent. Um, but it is just, it just feels lazy is what it is. Which can be infuriating, sure, but it's, 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 it's a fucking Peter Rabbit movie in 2018, which is probably exactly how you picture it. If you haven't seen it yet, but you know the premise. You got it all there. Um, and this whole, I mean, I, I, that's not even to go into how much I was, the most frustrating thing was how much time was spent on this love story of sorts, because it's so sudden, they seem to connect through nothing, and they do, like, like, obviously, it's the whole opposites attract thing, because she's so nice and sweet and loves animals, and he's a piece of shit, and, but they just, it's like, his character turns on a dime every time she's here, and then every time she's gone, to where it's like, you're not even sure if he's being sincere when he's with her, which of course it's going to turn out that he is, which makes it even more, uh, you just can't buy it at all. Um, 
And that's what a large portion of the movie becomes. It becomes like a jealousy thing. I am pretty sure one of the fucking Chipmunk movies tackled this. And this, honestly, not near to the stupidity or that much laziness, but I mean, yeah, I was getting a little bit of vibes of those Chipmunk movies watching this, if that tells you anything. This is a little better, obviously, but, I mean, once again, where the fuck is that bar? Um, and the funny thing is, is it, think also, speaking of laziness, let's see how many modern songs we can fit into it. How many popular songs. Just shoehorn them right in with no purpose whatsoever, except for the people to say, oh, I recognize this, we're having fun, or something. So, going on, we talk about the fact that something that's missing from this movie is the fact that it isn't clever. Um, so, when they make attempts to be clever, uh, they're really, really just gliding along. Because this is one of those movies where I'm sure they were trying to pass it off as a clever joke, but this is one of those movies that eventually gets bored with itself, and they fucking straight up tell us that. Like, they, they tell, like, Rose Byrne says that to us. When it gets to the climax, and they're, like, running around, the joke is for Rose Byrne to say, okay, we're going to speed this up. Here are the highlights. And we see them running around in various different ways. Once again, I think this is supposed to be some kind of meta-storytelling thing or whatever. Uh, no, I think the movie actually got bored with itself. I totally buy that, given where we were at this point in the story, where we're just watching every single turn that we were able to pinpoint five minutes into this thing, slowly but surely take its place. So, yes. Um, we get all those tired, predictable directions, and it's just everything you absolutely expect it to be. I'm, I'm sitting here, honestly, trying to think if I really dislike it as much as I'm coming off, because there's, this, this is a problem, but I mean, it's like, I, I don't know. Um, it's just... Yeah, I guess that's what it comes down to, is it's not insulting enough to say, I hate this, or something like that. Even though, I I feel like I could get myself there if I thought about it enough, but I think that's, that energy is much better spent hating things that are a lot more worth it. This is just, this is just this. It's gonna go away. Something else will replace it soon enough. And we can only pray that Paddington 3 gets here as soon as possible. For the children's sake. Um, speaking of children's movies and British movies, our last one's going to be Early Man, uh, which I was able to catch on Wednesday when I saw that special screening of the Philadelphia story. Kind of a weird double feature, but I went along with it anyway. Um, I was the only one in Early Man. Uh, <laughs> the box office tells you that's probably not surprising. So, I... The only thing, once again, the only thing I knew about this was that Ardman made a caveman movie. That's it. Uh, and uh, it was like, okay, it's got Nick Park's name on it. I'm sure it's, I'm sure it's great. At the very least, very good. So let's just do this. Um, and yeah, I was probably expecting along the lines of something like, um, like a British version of The Croods basically. And I like the Croods pretty well, at least as far as I can remember. That thing's already five years old, but um, the little memory I have of it, I remember thinking fondly of it. <laughs> so, um, it's, and I had heard a little bit, I had heard a little bit going in about how it was like, gonna kind of somewhat be a soccer movie as well, or football, if you don't mind me being all American saying soccer and shit. Um, so, I wasn't really quite sure what exactly the main focus was going to be. Didn't realize that was the main focus. So, um, and apparently, now that I've looked back on it after I saw it, uh, apparently that's what a lot of, that's the problem a lot of people have with it. So, um, especially outside of the UK, I guess. So, it does start off as, like, a caveman movie. Following this, uh, kid, kid, I guess, played by Eddie Redmayne. Uh, Ashley had mentioned this in one of the videos, and I didn't really 
I just kind of brushed it off and I didn't really think about it, but then it occurred to me again, I was watching it. Yes, I would never have believed this was Eddie Redmayne if I didn't know. Um, it was one of those cases where it's, he's made his voice so unrecognizably childlike. I was expecting that who we were looking at was the child version of his character and there was going to be a bit of a time jump and he was going to be an adult after like 10 minutes of the movie. Uh, but no, this is the character, and that's his voice. It's weird. Um, and so, you say the same thing for uh, Tom Hiddleston as well, playing the villain. But he, you can kind of, you can kind of hear his voice in there, like way in the back of his throat. You can hear his real voice. Um, so, and it's basically just them being. There's an amusing opening uh, where we get the uh, time period all the way down to it being lunchtime. Um, which is just, that's what I love about these movies, is nine times out of ten, the jokes are so innocent. I think that's just such a big appeal to these movies. That's why I love Wallace and Gromit so much. Um, I don't know if Chicken Run is as innocent <laughs> as the others, um, but it's their Shaun the Sheep, obviously. Uh, the Pirates, even. Even though people got pissed off about that leopard joke, it's still funny. Uh, <laughs> but the thing here is that they start off and they're hunting rabbits because for some reason uh, Nick Park has a hard-on for his characters hunting rabbits. <laughs> so there's that. Um, and it was to my understanding that he had worked on this for like, what, 10 years? Like it was some big passion project. Um, and yeah, for being that long, I mean, obviously with this type of animation, it's going to be a long time regardless. But I mean, to consider it like a passion project, it's like... It does feel incredibly minor. Uh, it's definitely not on the same page as uh, Wallace and Gromit or Check and Run or Shaun the Sheep. Or honestly, in my opinion, even Flushed Away. But I just really like Flushed Away, so that's only my particular perspective. Um, and I do get that it's like. It's to mind. Obviously, there's the whole being in America, there's going to be references that I don't get, and the fact that the whole movie is basically an allegory for these two different teams or whatever sides. And the thing about that is that, once again, I looked into it after I saw it, and it's like, I guess even people in the UK that are totally in on all these references and all these jokes that are going over so many people's heads outside of there, it's like, even then, some people are saying, even when we do get it, it's still a one-joke idea that goes on for way too long. And it's like, it's like the whole movie is just that one joke. They keep throwing, like, little references in there, uh, particularly the uh, commentator played by Rob Brydon uh, has, like, a bunch of little jokes in there that would go over the heads of people like me and many others. Um, but, like, even if I did get them from the sounds of it, it would be like okay, you've made your point, we get the joke, is there anything else you have to offer? Um, and apparently the answer is not really. Uh, <laughs> so that's a problem. Um, but that's not necessarily to take away from the... Uh, the animation itself, for instance, is really well done. Obviously all the characters more or less look like the characters in the other movies, but some of the backgrounds especially, like they, they look real. Um, and there's obviously some different designs here and there, for sure, that do stand out. Um, and there's, there's some crazy, sometimes they decide to, like, really go wild. Like, uh, the giant duck, which starts off as this humorous visual gag, but then ends up coming back a couple of times and being this kind of crazy thing in general. Uh, so that's commendable, and then there's, there's, there's some stuff in there that's a bit more obvious, like, um, their whole kind of digs at modern technology, only they're using, uh, a bird, a messenger bird that speaks, uh, it's, um, to do, where it's the, um, the older people don't know how to use, they're using it wrong and all that. Um, there is the, um, just those little details, like the, um, the, the board that's blocking off the entrance, and it actually has the do not enter symbol painted onto it, even though it's supposed to be the fucking Bronze Age or whatever. Um, and, yeah, there is also, 
the problem here, though, is that, once again, when you see, like, some of those innocent jokes, you just want to laugh anyway, because it's nice to see a movie that's just kind of so good-natured about itself. But the problem here, and I'm sure this also is, has to do with the fact that I just love all their other movies so much. Wallace and Gromit and Shaun the Sheep make me laugh so damn hard. Um, but it was like, I felt like after a while I was, like, forcing myself to laugh. You know, when you catch yourself doing that, when you, like, really want to like something. And it's like, I can say that's my fandom towards the, the company and their movies and, you know, Parks movies in general. Um, but I don't know. I think you can also credit that to just the likability of the movie in general. To where it's like, I like, I like the movie enough that I want to laugh when I'm supposed to, even if it, my heart's not totally in it. Um, I still think that says something about the movie. Obviously, certainly, that differs with circumstances, but in this particular case, um, I think it's a bit of a credit to the movie being able to get me to like it well enough, even if I'm not totally on board with it, um, and can feel myself kind of s slipping away from it many times. Um, the, it's, it left me wanting to come back to it, uh, because there was just that much of a likability to it just as a whole. Um, and yeah, once it really started to take over with the football plot, it was like, all the jokes I'm not getting aside, it's like, so how are they gonna, this, this, these movies are made in very clever ways. These, like, their sense of humor and their storytelling are just, go in so many fun and unexpected directions at times. So it's like, how are they gonna handle sports cliches? They just put in sports cliches, <laughs> it's, and it's not really anything particularly clever that like subverts them or anything. Um, all the way down to the whole uh, underdog gets his chance thing, underhog, I guess you could say in this case if you really want to. Um, so yeah, it's really I I I feel like being generous. Towards it, because like I said, it's just good natured enough and likable enough that I really wanted to be in that place enough to where I feel like I am to an extent. Um, but yeah, this one definitely falls short from their other movies, and I think once again, even if I were able to get all of those jokes, the sports related ones, I I still think it would grow tiresome rather quickly. So that's like most one joke ideas do you know whether there's a whole group of people that won't get them a one joke idea is still a one joke idea so there's that all right uh, we're done now it's six thirty. so um next week what the hell is even going on it's um the it's a uh, red sparrow and death wish i believe i plan on seeing both of those so we'll have that, um, and whatever the hell else. I'm sure something else will come up as well. Um, you'll get your assassin themed verses in a couple, a day or two, probably. Um, and the next one on Oscar Sunday is going to be a Best Picture winner with something else. So, like I said, both those movies are going to be from the 1940s. So, yeah, I, <laughs> I, I, yeah. So uh, I'll, I'll do that for me, at least. Uh, and after that, yeah, like I said, we got the big Bond video coming and a little less than a month, the Tomb Raider stuff, all that. So, um, and the whole Oscar prediction thing, hopefully on Sunday. So all that stuff. I don't know why I'm still talking to you at 6.30 in the morning. We're done. <laughs>